Hello and welcome. My name is Virginia Johnson and I'm Artistic Director of Dance Theatre of Harlem. And I'm so happy to welcome you to this Brain at, Brain at the Bar event. Uh, this is the second year that we're co collaborating with the Zuckerman Institute. And so I would like to express my thanks to the Dana Foundation for their support and also to Lisa Din for coming up with this great idea of bringing the Zuckerman Institute and Dance Theatre of Harlem together. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Paula Coxon. Thank, Thank you so, so much, Virginia. Virginia. And I'm so, so glad, glad that we, we did come together and to be doing this event for the second time. time. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. And today, what we're going to be doing is exploring a really important question that I think comes up all the time in the dance world and also in, in the everyday world, which is what is muscle memory? Is it even a thing? Um, where does it, where does it how, live? Is it in the brain or the body? Um, and we're going to be exploring that through the medium of dance and through the medium of science. Wonderful, wonderful. So we're going to start off with some dancing. You're going to see a small segment of a piece called Balamuk. It's a piece that Dance Theatre of Harlem is going to be performing next, uh, April 4th to 10th at New York City Center. It was choreographed by Annabel Lopez Ochoa with music that's going to be performed live by the Klesmatics. So today you're going to see a tiny segment danced by Amanda Smith, Derek Brockington, and Dylan Santos. Enjoy. applauding for you. I just want to applaud in, in person here. Amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm like very excited to get like a sort of personal performance. <laughs> so um, let's join uh, with our scientists for the next part of this program. We'll talk a little bit about how on earth you did that. Um, so, <laughs> so it's my pleasure to introduce the two scientists that I'm going to be speaking with today. Um, first up, um, our first uh, guest is an assistant arts professor of dance at MIU Tisch School of the Arts and co-artistic director of the Sean Karan Company, which I'm sure I pronounced terribly. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Betsy Coker. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Um, and our second guest um, is, is, uh, has a lot of different titles, um, but among other things, um, is a visiting research scholar at Brown University, an adjunct lecturer at Lehman College, and he's a Westheimer fellow through the Mark Morris Dance Group's Dance for Parkinson's Disease Company. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Gregory Udan. Greg, Betsy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, so let's start off um, by thinking about um, muscle memory itself. 
we've all heard that term, um, but many of us, I think, are wondering um, what that is. Does it live in our brains or in our bodies? Um, what's going on with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I'd like to start by reframing a little bit this idea that the brain and the body are separate. So I think when we talk a lot about brain-body connection or mind-body connection, it assumes that they're completely separate, which they never really work to begin with. And I certainly think in our experience, we'll hear from the answers to their experiences, but they're certainly not. Um, and maybe that's one way is muscle memory. So if something lives, so to speak, in your brain, it also lives in your body yeah i think too like it really comes from the idea of like the cartesian kind of dualism right of like the i think i therefore i am and that you can kind of separate the brain from the body and that that entity exists separate but like in our lived experience right we kind of don't have that right and that even the idea of you know the colloquial kind of muscle memory right like exists as memory kind of within the lived experience of the body mm. Yeah, and it might be considered a funnel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now we've been philosophical, yeah. yes. Um, but, you know, I think when we think experientially about it as movers, and the answer is certainly like we had that song answering those movers, we think about um, often the idea of sequencing comes up. So if I start a movement, the rest of them just sort of flow. That's one sort of chunk of it that's useful, and then the other one is this idea of like, and I don't really need to pay a lot of attention, actually. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I would say that those two components are like important to really get into, is the idea of sequence, chunking, and then attention. Yeah, because I think that that comes with the idea of like skill acquisition, right? Because um, we, we both study a lot of motor learning, right? And how the brain actually like learns to process these movements and kind of put these complex movements together, right? And like, that in and of itself is uh, a trajectory, right? Where um, what, what Betsy's talking about of like, you know, that the expert is going to use less attentional resources, right? To kind of do that same complex skill because they've put that representation in their brain, right? Right, so does that get less and less over time then as you're learning a new skill? Um, do you have to put a lot more attention in? Is it already? Ah. Yeah. No, I'm very serious. <laughs> 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 Thank you for um, Yeah, so with repetition, we become more automatic. So it's the sort of final stage of motor learning. Our dancers are obviously in the automatic stage and probably have been for quite some time. And that's what we think of really making an expert. So at that point, you, you are not using as much attention directed towards the way that you're doing things. And I know dancers really work at a very detailed level, so maybe they're surprised to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> In a lo neurological level, it, that is absolutely true than earlier learners, for sure. Got it. Um, yeah, and then the chunking bit of it, I think that's the other component that's important to talk about. And we discussed this previously, you used this really great example of the phone number, which is a really nice exam exemplar of this um, sequence learning effect, wherein the more repetition that you have while you're practicing something, the sort of fewer units you see in it. So if you're memorizing 10 numbers, you're thinking of 10 units. If you start to memorize a phone number, maybe you're thinking of three units, right? So mm. area code first three, and then the last four, if you're in the US, anyway. And then if it's your phone number, it's one unit. It's just your phone number. So it's encoded in fewer and fewer units the more repetition that you have. And so when we see that in dance sequences, I think it's a similar phenomenon. Yeah, that we as dancers don't learn each individual move, right? Like oftentimes a lot of audience members are like, oh my God, how do you remember, right? All of that, all of that movement. But dancers aren't processing it as like this individual move versus that individual move. Like even when we're taught in class or in an audition, it's taught as some sort of phrase of movement and it might be one longer phrase that we learn over time, right? But even in the learning part of it, you're breaking it up into smaller units to put together into that larger unit. And that's kind of how the brain is processing it. And then once it's really well learned, right, it becomes like that one phone number, right? That that's that one phrase that you can repeat kind of at, at nauseum, right? Because you've repeated it so many times. Right. 
And maybe, so maybe that explains then why someone asked me what the fifth digit of my phone number is. I can't retrieve it without, retrieving <laughs> without the doing the thing. entire thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, starting at the beginning. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> we may ask that the answer should be something challenging in this direction yeah. in a moment. But... Well, shall we, shall we bring the dancers in and ask yes. a little bit? I'd love to know, um, as someone who's not even remotely a dancer, let alone a professional, I'd love to know what it feels like to, to have this experience um, of, of muscle memory and, and chunking. Hello, dancers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hello. Lovely performance, and thank you for being game to um, open up your neurological motor process. Yes. <laughs> um, and I understand that there's a section of this piece that has some unison phrase work in it. So I wonder, Greg, do you think we should see that? Yeah, let's see. Can as we see you, the phrase? As you learned it, and I'm imagining have repeated many, many, many times. <laughs> okay. Great, thank right. you. Thank you. <laughs> so there were like three eights that I, you did all last together. Three eights right? That you did in unison together. Do you want to play with those? Yes, let's play okay. with those. What do, you, <laughs> what do you want to do? Um, I think so. How did you? Can you tell us a little bit of how you learned this phrase originally? Yeah. Oh, grab the mic. We learned in different parts, um, and uh, a little bit of everything that we were doing. To so we learned by eights. So our first eight would be one, two, three, four, five, six, five, five, five. So that was a Great. Yeah. So I think if we break it up by twos, it yeah. will break up that sequence for them. Like, yes. Could you, just as a problem solving exercise, um, work out the phrase as one, two, five, six, three, three four, four seven, seven, eight of the first eight. So you can see actually their like facial expressions, right? Um, as we're looking at this, that you can see that that is no longer kind of like automatic for them, right? And that it's breaking up that sequence in a way that they're not necessarily used to. So, right, so we've disrupted the sequence. Yes. And no longer can the sequence beginning be the key to the rest of the phrase. Yes. So they have to keep resetting to find that sort of um, traction, if you will. And also, like we were saying, that um, it's very clear, like, the physical process, they're as physically brilliant, they're having to pay more attention. Yes. So we see them actively paying more attention. But they also, um, from like a motor learning perspective, they have the idea of the movement already. So they have an underlying like knowledge of what the actual units are, but not kind of how to string them together because we've changed it up on them so much. <laughs> right. So we're disrupting that like muscle memory, if you will. <laughs> a terrible thing to have to do. What, can I ask? One, two, can I ask you just to five, talk six. about how how it's going? What's, what's easy about it? It feels a little crazy, but what's easy about it is that we have three brains. So I feel like mm. we can start, and he can catch the next phrase. She can catch the rest, and that's how we come together. Yeah. <laughs> and this is also somewhat difficult, probably, because you learned it as the eight, right? Yeah, and just like you said, um, we learn sometimes in a phrase. So our takeoff, it's not really a step, but it's part of the phrase. So when you go one, two, three, four, we don't have the takeoff. So that was the trick, which was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, since we learn things all in the sequence, it's hard to do it slow. And that's what we're doing right now. It's like, for some reason, it's so hard to like break it down. It's like, we could do this at full speed, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> but like when you're actually like taking it apart, that's when your brains are like, wait, 
Wait, what's the transition? <laughs> this is an unintended but wonderful example of this automaticity effect, which you are experiencing in the moment. <laughs> um, but this idea that if you take an expert learner, somebody who's really in the automatic stage, and they have practiced sort of weaning themselves off of the kind of effortful attention on the movements that they had earlier on. And then you direct their attention towards the task. And often they will fall apart a little bit. <laughs> 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 you know, in terms of like skill level, they're, they're doing the steps. It's that, you know, that jump that you said maybe had a difficult transition. We can't see that actually, right? But mm. that they, you know, it's like that, um, you know, Tiger Woods messed with his stroke, right? Like, <laughs> Not a good idea to take things apart at that sort of attentional level. So, so why is that? Why is it so difficult to to learn, like to relearn something in a different way? Is it more and, and is it more difficult than learning something new? Do you think? I I mean, at six of one, half dozen of the other would be my guess. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. Because the thing is that like this is also becoming a new phrase right mm -hmm. and like this is also something that a choreographer might actually make use of in a in a rehearsal process right to make a new phrase where they're like hey take this part from phrase a this part from phrase b right and this part from phrase c but then by the time i've learned it i'm not learning it as those individual movements of that individual section i'm thinking of it as a completely new phrase at that point but they're still kind of at this like novice level because we've put them into this novice situation right right, right. and right. it speaks also to you know teaching adults as beginners is very different from teaching children and that's in all contexts yeah <laughs> um so there's a sort of you know there's a lot of different confounds um i would also say you know if you're a new skill learner if you're learning to do these movements for the first time your challenges have probably to do with strength flexibility that your body is doing things that it hasn't done before yeah. That is not their challenge at the moment. It's more of the coordination, the planning. It's also right. like when we, we talk about it, it's like, what's the smallest unit, right? Like I actually kind of have a slight hypothesis that if we ask them to do the first eight, the third eight, and then the second eight, it would probably be much easier for them than what they're struggling with right now because we've taken what they think of as the smallest unit mm -hmm. into a different part. Yeah, we planned that. The yes, size we did. Is important. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> um, now we're going to test that. I can, yeah, can we yeah. actually see the first eight, the third eight, and then the second eight? As normal, <laughs> right? As normal. <laughs> As normal. Just the first eight, the third eight, and then the second eight. Yeah, can we see it uh, like Change first, together. third, second together as one? Yeah. So, but start with the first, go to directly to the third eight, and then come back and do the second eight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. There you go. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. so fewer nodes, fewer of those moments of having to strategize how to connect. Whereas in the first one, it was every two counts. <laughs> yeah. And, and probably a stress component as well. Uh, there, yeah, there's a stress component. Yeah, what, what was that like? That, that looked easier to us. We literally had to use our brains. <laughs> like, that was crazy to think about. Okay, the first phrase, or the first eight, is this. And the third eight is not the next thing. It's the, 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 the next thing. site. Like, it's putting yeah. it together is such an interesting thing. So. I'm happy that there's yeah. <laughs> it's crazy you don't realize how you kind of like go on muscle memory you kind of just turn it on and then when you actually get asked to like break it down that's when your brain's like oh wow yeah that was really hard <laughs> <laughs>
challenging, yeah. Challenging, yeah. yes. Challenging. <laughs> Thank Amazing. you. Thank you so much. much. That Thank you. Really, you did very well. That actually went better, I think, than we thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, it feels almost like um, it was a transition point that were really tricky in that case. And yeah. it's the smallest unit kind of, uh, of measurement, if you will, right, or the smallest unit that it's stored in their memory. The reason that I kind of hypothesized that this would be easier for them is because at the beginning, they said that they learned it as eight, phrases of eight, mm. right? So like, that's also going back to how they originally learned it. Even though I'm changing the sequencing up, I'm not breaking up it into a new sequence of it, right? Um, kind of into twos. That was just really difficult, right? <laughs> and like, they kind of didn't get to keep any kind of continuity in that and have mm. to keep kind of mentally processing that whereas here they're like oh it's the first eight okay and then it's the third eight right so there is still that problem solving but it's a lot less than if i kind of do it every every two like we did i would also i mean there's a component to this that's really adds to the kind of complexities so when we talk about muscle memories in the brain or in the body it really i think is doesn't um, belie the real complexity of what it is to be an expert mover and to learn you know along that trajectory, we're not only having our brain direct the muscles where to go, which is in itself very quite reductive, but as we move, we also are getting all of the sensory information, visual information, hearing, for perception, the sense of where our bodies are in space, our inner ear, and all of it is fused to this one experience. It's not, they're not, you know, sort of, we are integrating them all, all the time. It's quite complex, and the more experience that you have, the more complex and rich your representations for the movement are. So I was even curious about something like, you know, the first phrase you have, that first eight you have with counts, but can you imagine how you would like intonate it? Teacher, dance teachers do this all the time, don't they? Choreographers do. <laughs> like the sort of like, if you could sing it, does it have a sound to you the way that it's? Okay. <laughs> I didn't plan that. Um, yeah, like, um, and you go by the choreographer themselves. Like, sometimes they come in, they go, ra, pa, 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 pa. and that's the sound that we, they want our bodies to move into. So I feel like we, that makes us more motivated to actually do this stuff, too. Grab the microphone. Grab the microphone. Do we remember sounds with certain steps, like one, two, three, wow, or whatever. I mean, that wasn't the sound, but. Yeah. You know, and sometimes that helps remember the step as well. Can I also ask how, um, when did you start learning this piece? Okay, and how, um, I mean, with the pandemic, but how many times have you performed it? Many, many, many times. Yeah, so yes. this is something that's like really well learned and really well practiced, right? And like um, with what Betsy was saying too, like, the more that you tour the piece, right, and the more that you kind of have these varied experiences of the piece, right, it changes the representation of it in your brain because you're kind of able to pick up on those like subtleties maybe a little bit earlier, right? Like, oh, the stage has something here. Like, let me do that, right? Because you're not kind of using those same attentional resources to what the phrase is. Also the music too. Yeah. The more you listen to the music, and the more you're used to the choreography as well, I find that you start to listen to different parts of the music. You know, like the things that you heard in the beginning, you you hear, but now you, you hear extra things in the back. And you're like, oh, yeah. now I see what Annabelle was talking about when she said, ooh, move your head on this, because now I yeah. hear that little woo -woo -woo, whatever it was. Yeah. There's um, a thing too in motor learning called like the encoding specificity, which is like that the way that you learned it, right, kind of becomes ingrained in your brain so like the music and the dance is one right like it would be also very different if we changed the music on you and said like do do this to new music right um it would you would still have the the kind of memory of like what the phrase is but it would feel very different in your body yeah we actually just got a new recording of the music oh. because <laughs> well yeah for a new have live music so we have to practice with that and it just it's incredible how our brains were like okay this sounds like it but you're almost doing something different with your body because you 
can hear it differently. And when the choreographer Annabelle was with us, she had us really listening to it for one of the runs and it changed us. We were like so slow and so different and we ended up being late for the end of it. But it just changes how we were thinking about it in our mind. Yeah. Right. Amazing. <laughs> You're not going to make them dance to some new music right now. No, no. Right <laughs> I think they could, they could do anything. <laughs> I, I think you probably could do anything, but we've been, we've been quite mean to you already. <laughs> All right. So, so I'm very curious about the learning process and how, how somebody would start off learning this then. Do you learn individually? Um, to begin with, or do you, do you start learning a group dance like this together? Because I feel like there's also a social aspect to this, right? All together, yeah. Yeah, so I wonder also if you were performing it with different people, whether that would have a different... I mean, partnering for sure, right? So that is going to have a... You know, and it's not just the, like, uh, you know, height differential, maybe that would have a big effect or not but everybody has these tiny little micro movements that they do when they prepare and as partners I think you learn that really yeah. I'll have the partners <laughs> you know it's really interesting because we do have cast changes so someone um, whoever is dancing in front of me like a Dylan isn't there and it's someone else I have to try and match what they're doing and it changes how I'm dancing and it's actually very interesting for my mind to pick up on I pick up on all of these subtleties that he does and then when it's someone else, so you have to kind of change and adapt to like whatever that new, it's not necessarily doing a new movement, but it's, it's trying to still vibe and be with the person next to you if it's, even though it's not the same. Uh, the neuroscientist in me wants to point out <laughs> because a huge social, artistic, expressive element of that. And we could say a lot about your relationships to each other and all that, but you know, well, it's like with the brain. Yes. <laughs> motor learning, you know, the classic, like, triumvirate of motor learning. We talk about the task, so what it is you're doing. The individual, everybody's different in many different ways, and the ways that we differ, yes. you know, the ways that we very change how we learn, how we move, um, and then the environment. And so that makes sense if it's a sticky floor, you know, slippery floor, whatever, but actually the, the, size the, stage, the size of the stage, the bright like lights. The lighting, yeah. But it also has to do, I think, the interesting, wonderful thing about dance that, yes, it's social, but it's also that you become part of each other's environment. Yes. So in that example, the dancers around you are part of your, what we would call an open environment, in yes. which you have to stay attuned to them. You know, you know this very well. It's not enough just to take care of yourself on stage. <laughs> and I would also say, like, your, um, you're picking up on his, like, intricacies, right? Like, do you feel like that's necessarily like conscious or that that kind of has, once you've practiced it enough, it becomes more automatic for you, right? Like you don't even notice it until you get a partner. It's, it's exactly that is I don't even really realize it until I try to do the same thing and I'm like, oh, this person's like one half count ahead of me or they stretch their, <laughs> they're like just a little bit differently. So I have to really try and match them or think about it. Like, I'm yeah. like oh, I didn't even think about this before. And that has like the, the same like human variability to it, right? And it's the same thing that's happening in the music too, because like if it's that live music or a different person playing it, you have that human's like motor kind of variability that like, oh, they're taking a half beat breath here or like a rest here. And like suddenly you're like, oh, that is no longer predictable for me, right? So like I can't kind of rely on that model or representation in my brain now it's like a, a hiccup almost, right? To kind of reprocess it in that new way. Especially too when we get new partners, but then if we stay doing the, me and Derek, we dance together a lot, but then sometimes we switch Amanda. So then we have to be more careful when we get the other girls because Amanda tell us to do one way and she wants it this way. <laughs> <laughs> the, right, and uh, so like we need to take into consideration what she wants, but we also need to take into consideration what the other cast needs. So like that makes completely yeah. sense because it's definitely like a new field for all of us. Oh, yeah. And it's also fun for me to, uh, to have two partners because usually, you know, you do a pata da and it's just a one woman, one man. Um, but it's so much fun to have two because I'm just, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like I can have like chemistry and energy with both of them. Um, so throughout the whole thing. And I think that was the fun part about Annabelle's choreography is like, okay, now you look at him, Ooh, and then you go to him, and then you're together. And it's just a lot of shifting of weight and energy. And I think it's, it's really nice to be able to do that because you don't normally see that in ballet.
So Greg, you used a word that caught my attention there, the word prediction. Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't want to go too deep, but like I am very curious, like how much, um, how much role does prediction play in a, in a, in a you know, something like this in, in our brains and our bodies versus reaction, I guess, which would be the other point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it like, it definitely plays into a part, right? But like the amount kind of, of, predictability allows you to be more automatic with it right mm -hmm. like as soon as that predictability of it kind of goes away then by nature you have to be more reactive to it right and that can be like anything like it could be you know one of the the trio is slightly further away than they normally are right and you're like oh that feels slightly different it's not that an expert performer can't overcome that right like and the more experienced and experts that they are in that phrase, and the more experience that they have doing it in all of these different environments, right? Like the better that that model is, and the more adaptable that the dancer actually becomes. Because we were talking also about like the human variability of movement, right? Like, right. I think that like one of like the misnomers, correct me if you will, but like, is that like as dancers, we think like, I do this the exact same way every single time. Right. And like no human movement is exactly the same every single time. There is some amount of variability that happens. And when we have a trio like this, there's three amounts of variability because each dancer has their own individ individual variability. But then they're kind of all adapting together as that one unit to do the beautiful dancing we saw. Yeah, I think that I would also add that by the time that we see a movement, movement as the observable action of displacing the body through space, that it's already been planned. So we have that movement that happens before we even see placement of the body. So planning, execution, if you will, and then the sort of like dealing with it. Like what <laughs> happened, the error validation, like did what I think was gonna happen happened or not? And then that kind of integration, like the, the understanding sort of what you need to, to take from, from that. And that's happening all the time, very, very, very fast. Yes. And so I think if something changes while you're pre-planning a movement, you're in the planning phase, you can switch gears, absolutely. You know, if you've already sort of started the execution phase, maybe it's a little bit more difficult mm. if you have to, like, sort of, when is the interruption happening? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think we can use that to, we use that to our advantage when we're teaching movement this idea of contextual interference. Do you want to go into that? No, yeah, maybe. I don't know. So <laughs> it's another, I mean, it, I'll just suffice to say, um, when teaching is about challenge, right? So teaching is about finding a challenge point. You want to make sure that the learner, whether it's motor learning or dance teaching or math learning, whatever it is, that they are challenged, right? That they're doing something that they, they can't just already automatically do or else they're not learning. So that's a way of actually adding challenge is to sort of increase unpredictability in specific ways yeah. um, to interrupt, to interfere a little bit so that the, you're putting the learner in the context of having to regroup. Yeah. And arguably, in terms of this sort of theory of contextual interference, it's in the moment of regrouping that we learn. Um, I'll nice. also add, so um, both Betsy and I went through the motor learning program at Teachers College, Columbia University, which was started <laughs> um, by a woman by the name of Anne Gentile. And she talked about um, that the more active problem solving, the better that the learner would be, right? So like the more scenarios as a teacher um, or a choreographer, right, that I can put you through so that you learn it in many different ways, the better that that representation is gonna be for you. And I think of contextual interference or changing that as a way of increasing that movement problem solving um, throughout all of this. Shout out to Richard McGill for contextual yes. interference. Yes. <laughs> 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 both at TC and NYU. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go back to my day job at NYU unless I mention him. Yes. <laughs> Well, we've got our credit. Yes. Dancers, I'm going to let you rest for a, for a couple of minutes. Um, and we will bring you back to dance again, but we're not going to mess with you anymore. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so
Greg, Betsy, I want to ask you a little bit then, we've sort of talked about learning and when it's most optimal, but I also would like to talk, because I know you both know a lot about this, about, about when we have to learn. So situations in which um, we maybe experience an injury, a physical injury to mm. our body, um, or, or a physical injury to our brain, um, uh, you know, some kind of challenge. How does how does uh, injury in our body affect our brain, and an and you know something in our brain affect our body? Um, and how how hard is it to overcome those things? I mean, I think um, I'm comfortable speaking about what we might think was like peripheral injury, orthopedic injury, um, and the potential effects on the brain. This is a pretty new area. It's quite mm. exciting. There's a lot we don't know, but. And then Greg maybe can talk about the other way around. So yeah. injury to the brain affects mm -hmm. the body. Um, yeah, so dancers obviously, unfortunately, but truthfully, get injured quite frequently. Um, and there's a lot to be said about it. It has a lot of different facets. But just in terms of this, again, thinking about brain body, um, I think it's becoming more clear in the literature in an active research right now that an injury to the periphery, so say ankle sprain or ACL, anterior cruciate ligament injury, both very common in dance and in sports, do actually have an effect on your brain. Um, and I don't think that that was something that was commonly thought of for a long time. And one of the things that we could think of in a really like um, thinking about neuroplasticity in a very sort of fine-grained way is that if you know we have all these different sensory apparatuses for how we move, we see, we hear, we have our inner ear for balance, we have our somatosense, our periphery receptors, which are a conglomerate of sort of sensors in the body, in the peripheral body, that let us know where our body is in space. Now, quite often, they these sort of specific periphery receptors um, lie in soft tissue of the joints. So if you have an injury to a soft tissue like an ACL um, injury, or I'm specifically looking at lateral ankle sprains, which are very common, the most common dance injury, um, we think that there's this disruption of that bottom-up processing. So all of a sudden, we're missing some information. And so the brain, now we have a lot of um, sort of imagery-based uh, research to show that the brain is actually rewiring in response to that. So not only do we have pain, which disrupts motor learning quite a bit, it disrupts the sort of rehabilitative functioning, physiological functioning as well, and that's a whole other area that we want to talk about, right. but it's very important. Um, but we actually have this sort of reorganization of the cortexes and the way that they are driving movement because of this injury. So it's, it's very new, but we're starting to think about ways that that might affect rehabilitation. So one thing we do know, just to keep it really short, um, one thing we do know is that even in the automatic expert stage, a dancer who might have this soft, soft tissue injury and might show some decrements to that somatosense when they're performing, even when they seem to be back strength-wise, um, that they have to fill in the gap with attention. So we see them using, you know, through fMRI and through EEG, we see them in, in functional connectivity studies, we see them using more effortful attention, even in something simple like balance. Right. Um, so I think, you know, that's sort of the place that we're at. We, I don't have like therapeutic recommendations yet, because we're really in the thick of the research of it. But it's indicative, again, of like, it's like a really, it's a big multifaceted um, experience. It's not just, you know, is your calf muscle strong enough to point your foot? <laughs> right, right, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, and so a lot of the work that I do um, actually falls in like the dance for health realm, right? So it's kind of taking all of the benefits of dance to try to rehabilitate like people that have neurodegenerative or like brain disorders, right? Mm. So specifically, I do a lot of work with Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, right? Which are both um, movement disorders, right? Of some kind of capacity, whether that's excess movement or not enough movement, right? And one of the things um, that we were talking about earlier is that like dancers come to class every day right, to kind of like work on, on their movement, right? And some of the things um, that are inherent in a dance class, right, are beneficial for, for rehabilitation, um, especially of, of the brain, right? Um, one of the things is that we're talking kind of about like the cognitive 
right things that dancers are doing. Like we think of them as like beautiful movers, right? But like we also showed when we like broke up the phrase into two that they're doing a lot of like problem solving and thinking about things, mm -hmm. right? There's also this aspect of they're not just doing that, but they're timing it to music, right? So like, um, especially in Parkinson's disease, the, the rhythm of the music, right, kind of can have this external effect on them. Um, one of the things that we, that we think of is that with Parkinson's disease and music, you're kind of accessing the motor system through the auditory system and that that's bypassing some of like the circuitry that isn't working as well in the basal ganglia, right? Mm -hmm. So what we've actually kind of done is use the inherent nature of what's kind of happening in a dance class and like brought that into like a neuro rehab context, not to kind of like rehabilitate um, or treat the people with Parkinson's, right? But to treat them as dancers, right? Cause they are dancers and they're performing and, you know, getting kind of this beautiful art form, but that this beautiful art form kind of has these different entities in it already, right? Because oftentimes in like a, in an exercise model, we think of working like one muscle at the time, at a time, right? And that that is also not kind of engaging the imagery of it or the emotional expression of it or the, the problem solving of it, right? It's just like, okay, I'm gonna do 10 repetitions where dance kind of has all of these other things. So they're kind of getting this like hyper effect of all of these things happening at the same time. Right, right. Goodness, so many ways in which neuro, <laughs> neuroplasticity can play a role. Yes, yeah. Um, and, it, and if you have a question uh, for our scientists or our dancers, um, and you haven't already put it in the chat, um, and you're watching along, please do, and we will try to get to a couple of them. Um, before we do that, let's watch again uh, the dance excerpts that, um, that we saw at the beginning from Balamuk uh, with, with all of our new knowledge in mind. <laughs> with us now, I think. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> Wonderful. So I'm going to invite Virginia back up on stage. I'm going to invite Greg and Betsy back up on come stage. Come back, come back. Bravo, incredible. Um, and uh, we're, we're not texting, I promise. We are receiving messages <laughs> in real time. Um, so yeah, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll start with, the, with the, this uh, first one on my list here. Um, so uh, the, the question asker says, this is an interesting point about movement also being intuitive. The choreographer choosing to sequence movements together that naturally flow together, right? You talked about that before. Um, so um, I wonder if the dancers and scientists can speak more to how motor learning processes may unconsciously inform our creation of movement. So how do those two things play into each other? That is such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, there's one of the sessions that we just did that totally relies on the choreography so that if one thing goes wrong, then it kind of messes up the whole thing because it's all in one sequence and we're all doing it together. So if one of us mess up, then we kind of all mess up. So, and I feel like how that ties into like the creation aspect of it is that she had to teach it to us, each of us, and yet we had to, we still have to kind of use, it, she taught it to us individually, but then our environment is what uh, shapes the movement. So it's like if one thing goes wrong in the environment, then everything else goes wrong. So it's interesting how she was able to kind of like create that in, in that process. Cause I, I, I find that really difficult to do. <laughs> so it's just really interesting how she was able to like create that in that. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I It's such a great question because it's so huge. Cause I think it's really getting at like aesthetics. And yeah. you know, when you think about <laughs> and, uh, um, when we started doing this trio in particular, um, the choreographer was so excited about how much go, go, go we had, but it was all because of Amanda. Amanda would just do things and we just had to like, go with her, so I feel like that creativity, like that, that build the creativity from there, from like her, just her power, and I was just carrying it on, like just made things flourish, I think, which I think. Yeah, I think, like for example, in the beginning, when you come in, it's like, transitioning out of steps as well that helped the creativity. I think she saw, okay, well, you're coming, you're falling this way, so from that fall, you're gonna go this way, and then you're gonna go this way, and then just like that, literally the entire Can I ask a question to you as well? Um, this trio was made on you, right? Can you talk about the difference between this trio being made on you and a dance that you've learned that isn't made on you, and like what that learning process was like? I think when it's made on you, um, you get to, I feel like right away you can find your individuality a little bit more. Um, you can almost go into performance quali quality sooner. When it's something that's not made on you, you kind of have to shift into, like a lot of times it's like, okay, what is this stuff again? Okay. And then the performance comes after that. You know, it's a little bit, it's interesting how that works. It's kind of the opposite, you know, rather than like when you're, you know, it's created on you, so you're like, oh, well, this is yeah. made on you, so I can, <laughs> you know, have a little more fun, and then vice versa, you're kind of like thinking of the steps, and yeah. the personality comes. And what after. was making me think of it, right, was the intuitiveness of the question that was asked, right, because oftentimes I feel, like as a dancer, when it was made on me, it feels much more intuitive, because I had some sort of part in kind of that creation process, and like, because I was in the creation process, that's informed my memory and like my representation of it, as opposed to like either learning it from somebody else teaching it to me or learning it through like a video or kind of whatever other form that I'm learning of, of it, where that intuitiveness of like how I want to move in it is a part of like when I learned it. But it's also something that happens because your body, I have a microphone, <laughs> because your body and the proportions of your body and your energy and all the things that are part of who you are yeah. is actually built into the choreography. Yeah. It's not an alien thing that you've got to put on and make comfortable. It already belongs to you. It does, yeah. Yeah. That's the, the really important first part of it, right? That I think that, I think maybe the question has to do with the sort of like, momentum flow and your your biomechanics are sort of instinctively given perhaps mm -hmm. towards certain types of you know momentum and and also just what feels good but it's also couched like all of this movement it's not just brains and bodies it's couched in the culture of it too so you know certain dance cultures have different 
priorities, perhaps, you know, if you were teaching this to like a tap dancer, they might really want to be prioritizing a rhythm structure more than prioritizing where the arms or the legs go. And that, you know, I, I think I should not ever speak publicly, but here I am about aesthetics because <laughs> that's really not my area. But I, guess, I mean, the question is, I'm going to write it down later because it's, it, motor learning movement science to me is such a wonderful field because it is so interwoven and inextricable from all of these other parts. Mm. Yeah, I can really see that. Yeah. way of not answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what academics are good at, right? So it makes sense. Um, so I feel like this question is, is, um, is getting us a little deeper into the brain for the scientists. So, so when, when you're relearning something, um, which in, in many senses you probably already always are now because you know so many things, right? So you're just kind of putting things together. Um, but when, especially when you were relearning that sequence when they made you do two, two, two. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, the question is, are they going back all the way to that cognitive stage when, when these folks are doing it, these professionals, um, or are they taking some kind of shortcut, basically? I I mean, I would argue that they're not, they're not going all the way back to a cognitive stage because they're also not going all the way back to being a beginner, right? Like these are expert answers. And also like we were talking about that sequencing, right? They already have the idea of the movement, right? And they have all of those individual components and all of those individual components are already stored in their brain. We're just asking them to sequence it differently. So it's becoming a new entity. Yeah, exactly. So I think the shortcut is in that, that they have all the pieces. They've, they're experts at the tasks at hand. You know, we're sort of slicing the tasks up differently. Um, and then I would guess, you know, I think the sort of prefrontal and frontal cortex areas that have to do with the motor planning are going to be more active. Um, and then generally in terms of, I mean, we're not going to see like one area that just shouts out like, I am attention and now I'm active. But we would probably see a more global different type of um, frequency patterning happening. They're going to be sort of their brain waves in general are going to be patterning in a different frequency band because they're using more um, conscious attention. Ooh, say more about that. Wow. Uh -oh. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, I mean, you know, I think just to get, kick the door open a little bit for anybody who wants to do future study. Um, so EEG, electroencephalogram encephalography where you have the you know you see like the cap with the wires mm -hmm. coming out of it is a classic way for us to study attentional resources during movement um, and in different attentive states we are sort of the electrical activity in our brains is patterning in different uh, bands of frequency mm -hmm. faster or slower and in different ways you know it's sort of diffused throughout the brain the brain in different patterns that we can then use as sort of signatures of different attentional states. Yeah, I also think that there's one thing that we should mention is that a lot of these like studies that have happened originally on movement use very simple motor tasks, like finger tapping or like moving a cursor on a screen because that's what we could study, right? And like we can't kind of put a dancer into an MRI or like an fMRI machine and ask you to dance in it, right? Because we're not going to get that. So like we're often making assumptions based on these small movements of what complex movement actually is, but we've never kind of had the opportunity to like look at like an EEG on a full dance. Right? There's a few studies like and they've come out in like the last year. Oh. So I know, to be continued. Um, yeah. No, <laughs> mo yeah, mobile brain body imaging is like super new. Um, and it, I'd mostly, as you would probably understand, like think of a yeah. huge data processing issue because your motor cortex is firing while you're moving and then your body's moving and there's all this other mm -hmm. stuff inside. like a lot of noise that has to be filtered out but look for it soon in your favorite academic research publication <laughs> 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 and then there are also these brain areas that are yeah. involved right. as well as the brain rhythm so you mentioned the prefrontal cortex you mentioned the basal ganglia so how do those those, those guys work together it sounds like one of them takes over more when you're learning something new or relearning one of them seems important for executing movement in general are there other areas involved in like one minute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a, I think a sort of instinct to talk about this like area specifically when yeah. in reality it's really 
quite interconnected, and particularly at this level of expertise, quite inter interconnected. But we think about motor planning, so uh, you know what they are planning to do before they execute, and the way that that has to be more sort of effortfully attended to. We want to think more about like pre the premotor, prefrontal cortex, frontal cortex, premotor, and then supplementary supplementary motor cortices as well. Yeah. And then, I mean, we think of like the basal ganglia and the cerebellum kind of also playing a role in human movement. But like, we were also talking earlier about like the, the neuroplasticity and how the brain can kind of change itself, right? So like after an injury or after, um, you know, a, a brain disease, right? Some parts of your brain may remap to kind of help with other areas, right? Um, and that representation might change for you, right? Like, for example, like somebody who loses a limb that area of the brain that used to kind of control that might add in to control other areas, right? Because it has oh. that resource available. We're going to have to plug motor imagery, Greg. Yes, go for <laughs> it. Gonna That's happen. your area. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, I was like, how can I turn every talk into an opportunity to talk about <laughs> motor imagery? So motor imagery is this something we practice in dance all the time, visualization. So mm -hmm. without moving your body, close your eyes and imagine yourself doing a task. We do that all the time. You probably do it before you fall asleep every night. Um, and we know that the same areas of the brain are largely overlapping areas of the brain are active when we're imagining ourselves move as when we're actually moving. And that's become a big window into learning more about like surfacing with sort of our own individual representations of movement through how we're imagining movement. And in terms of rehabilitation, potential uses for that as well. So if you're in a splint, and you can't move your ankle, and it's better if you don't because you're still rehabilitating and you're you know, um, perhaps trying to not use it, you can practice enacting the representations for that movement by imagining them. Yeah. There's also, like, if we kind of go back to the work of, like, Irene Dowd and, like, Lulu Swigard and Mabel Todd of, like, the idiokinesis, um, it, there's also a thought process that, like, the visualization will give you time to kind of repattern what's happening in your brain, right? And give you that um, moment to kind of think about it and try a different option or a different strategy for movement that you might not necessarily have when you're moving so quickly. Right. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I, and I wish we had more. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> I'm going to go home and visualize the heck out of things now. I'm just going to be visualizing all day. I'm guessing it only works really well if you can already do the thing. But anyway, um, thank you. So, yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for thank being you, just dancers. wonderful yeah. dancers. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Greg, Virginia. Thank you so thank much you. for uh, being our partner in this. Um, and thank you all for watching. Thank you. And join us next week for Muscle Memory Part 2, Muscle Memory in Action. Dr. Greg Udan will be here with us and uh, uh, phys physiotherapist uh, Sarah Idri Altus from the Harkness Foundation for Dance Injury will be here to talk about some practical aspects of muscle memory. Thank you so much. This has been fun. Thank you. Thank you.